Hello, congratulations on making it back in time. Next up, we have Nicola, who asked me not to divulge too much, except the fact that he is a very nice guy. Yeah. I encourage you to talk to him after his talk. Uh, He's going to tell us a little bit about Ethereum and how to get started with it. And uh, I'm not going to keep it too much, so please, Nicola, take it away. Thank you very much. Hi, everyone. Uh, I feel like Herr Professor. (laughs) It has been a while back since I didn't go to university. Uh, Yeah, I'm Nicola Frankel. Um, I've been doing development for like 17 years, three months ago. I changed my job. Now I have a developer advocate. So I'm not on project anymore, no pressure. I'm just paid to go to talk to conferences, write blog posts, do proof of concept. It's really nice. Encourage you to do it. Obviously, I see a lot of young people here. Who here is still a student? Technically, okay. (laughs) So about half the room. Okay, thanks. And the other are working, right? You are developers, the rest? Yeah, who here is a developer? Okay, thanks. Okay, um, so I'm a Java developer. Well, I was, technically. Um, um, but I got interested about the blockchain because, I mean, who doesn't hear about the blockchain every day? Now it has settled down a bit, but like six months ago, everybody talked about the blockchain, how it could revolution the world and everything. So I got interested. I wanted to try it myself. and. Well, the documentation is, well, let's say, of various quality. And you need to, like, find the stuff yourself. And I found Ethereum, and this is my talk about it. I'm employed by a super nice company that sent me here called Exoscale. So if you like the talk, please go to the website so that then send me uh, to this conference next year. We are uh, selling uh, cloud computing instances. So instead of giving all your data to American companies here in Europe, you are protected by GDPR or by the German law or by the Swiss law. We are for data center. I encourage you to check further. Before we start, as I said, I'm a Java developer, so I'm not a fintech expert. I'm not a blockchain expert. I'm not an Ethereum expert. I'm just a developer that got interested into that. So don't expect me to talk about Merkle tree, proof of work, and this kind of stuff. It will be very development oriented. Also, if you thought you were going to get rich by coming here because it's a blockchain, forget about it. No commitment about that. So what is a blockchain? Well, obviously, it's a chain of blocks, and it's done. I mean, nothing wonderful about it. You just put stuff upon other stuff. Who here already use Git? Great, everyone. Um, so imagine you have no merge, no rebase. You are just writing every time on master. This is the most stupid blockchain you can ever get because every commit references the previous commit. So if you don't branch, if you don't rebase, if you don't do anything, you have a single branch and that's basically the blockchain. There are several properties of the blockchain, at least of the blockchain I will talk about. Some blockchain want to be private. Well, I'll. this the most important property of the blockchain is immutability. So just like in Git, if you don't have rebase, you cannot change the blockchain. You can only roll back a commit you have previously made by creating a new commit that does the exact opposite. So immutability is pretty important because in the end, there is a proof that everything that happened really happened. Second property, it's distributed. If you are doing Ethereum, everybody has a copy of the blockchain on his computer. I have the copy on my computer right now. That means that also, if you don't trust the other guy, then you have the proof that on your computer something happened. Well, there are tricks because sometimes it has happened that you get unsynchronized and then you need to keep up with the distribution of the blockchain. And of course, you can do it on purpose and try to mine your own blockchain. But normally, that shouldn't be the thing to do. And finally, it's transparent. 
everybody is able to check what happened on the blockchain by whoever he wants. I will show you afterwards. You can have a transaction, a wallet, whatever. Put the hash into some special website. You've got the information. You can also do your own stuff on your local blockchain, but the website is pretty good. gives you very nice information. So everything is transparent. The only thing that is not transparent is who the wallet belongs to. And that's why some people don't like the blockchain, because it can be anyone. It can be used for money laundering and this kind of stuff. But the wallet, everything is in the clear. So he, who here doesn't know about Bitcoin? Yeah, that's what I thought. Ethereum? OK. OK. Uh, and the rest are less and less known because the rest uh, like represent less and less value. So I took the figures at the beginning of the year, like Bitcoin is a lot of money, Ethereum is a lot less money, and it goes down and on and on and on. I just want to tell you my personal opinion here. Probably fintech experts would disagree. This is just worth zero. Every one of them is worth zero. When you buy something, if you buy a car, you have the car. If you buy a pair of shoes, you have a pair of shoes. Even if you buy gold, well, you don't get the gold, but you get a piece of paper that proves that you have the gold. Here, you are just buying bits. This is the worst stuff that can happen. This is pure speculation. This is the biggest Ponzi scheme in history. This is my personal opinion. You are welcome not to agree. That's fine. Um, but again, it, I won't change my mind. Also, if you read a bit about blockchain, you might see that the projection, the more popular it becomes, the more energy it consumes, until the percentage of energy it consumes becomes relevant regarding global energy consumption. So it's also, from an environmental point of view, very, very bad. Bitcoin is pure speculation. Ethereum. What you can do on it is code. If you are a developer, that's really cool. So that's why I chose not to talk about Bitcoin, because Bitcoin, yeah, you can, you can buy, you can sell, and that's all. Ethereum is very interesting, in my opinion, much more interesting. So you can write code, you can deploy it on the blockchain, and then you can interact with the blockchain, with what they call that distributed app, which basically are just JavaScript. So what is Ethereum? Ethereum is based on a stuff called the virtual machine. And basically, the virtual Ethereum machine is just, well, a distributed computing instance that can contain stuff called accounts. So far, it's just a stupid definition. There are two types of accounts. The first type of account is, well, you have an account just like in the bank you have an account. So this is pretty simple stuff. The other thing is the code that you deploy on Ethereum also is an account. It's called a contract. It's called a smart contract. And you can send money to it. You can send transaction to it. And then it's where the magic happens. By default, Ethereum does nothing. If you don't interact with it, it does nothing by itself. Just like a database. I, like, I really like the database analogy. As long as you don't query anything, as long as you don't update anything, nothing happens. The database stands still. And then, with a database, you send a query. Or you, send, you, you execute a stored procedure. And then, something starts to happen. It's exactly the same thing with Ethereum. If you, can, if you send money, well, if you send Ether to a contract, so basically to a code that is deployed on the blockchain, then this contract will execute itself. So how do you start coding? Well, Ethereum runs bytecode. This is not Java bytecode. It's its own specific brand of bytecode. 
By choice, they created a new language called Solidity to create this bytecode. I know there is a Pythonic way to also create this bytecode. I think there is also a C or C++ way, but if you just don't know Python or don't know C or C++, Solidity is the main entry point. And besides, that's where all the documentation is. Solidity, who knows Solidity already? One, two person. So the rest are in the rest room. For the two pe people who know, I don't know if you learn a lot, but anyway. Solidity um, is statically typed. I, um, obviously, since I come from Java, for me, this is very important. I'm not super fond of, of dynamically uh, typed language, just like JavaScript and Groovy. We, ca we have kind of inheritance. We have a very limited support of libraries. I hope it gets better in the future. And we can define our own type. And that is very important. If you are doing object-oriented programming, you can get back on your feet by using that. So let's start the demo first, because I do a lot of demo. Otherwise, slideware is not very interesting. We can start coding by installing nothing. You just go on this website, remix.ethereum.org, and you can start coding right now. The first line tells the version of Solidity that you will be using. The latest is 0 0.5, but since I'm a developer, I'm super lazy, I didn't update it, I didn't check the latest update. Just do as with me, use the version you are comfortable with. Then, if you have the, who here is a Java developer? Ah, a lot of people. Scala, less people. Kotlin? Whoa, rocks. More than Scala. Guys, I love you. Um, um, so instead of having this class, like first level object, we have, we have something called contract, because yeah, we are creating contract. And then even if you have never seen any solidity, it's pretty clear what this function does, right? No, it's too much. So I will do like that. Up. Right, we had this add function, which takes two ints. It's, public. it's public, and it returns an int, which is the sum of both. Right? Just by default, we have auto-compilation, and auto-compilation tells us that there is a warning because it tells us, yeah, the function state mutability can be changed. Why? Who here is a functional programmer or knows about functional programming? And not, not many people. So basically, this is a pure function because it depends only on the input parameters and it has no side effects. It's just return something. So that the first nice thing about Solidity is that it has this, con con um, this concept of pure function, so we must tell it that it's pure. In that case, it understands it doesn't need to interact with the state of the blockchain. And so it, the, the bytecode is basically optimized for that. Then we can see here that we return an int. Why do we have parents? Well, the good thing also about the solidity is we can name the, whoa, public prior return, no, sorry. We can name the return value, much better. Um, that's something that is very rare, so it deserves to be mentioned. Um, also, we can return multiple parameters. So instead of uh, being, uh, or returning a tuple, uh, sorry, of creating your own uh, class, then we can say, okay, I will return a tuple, and then we can say, yeah, I will return A, B, and this line. So far, so good? No question? Pretty simple, straightforward, no rocket science. The next step is to run. And here, we won't use the blockchain, we will stay in our browser, much better. Um, and we will use a JavaScript VM, which is out of the box. But we will emulate the blockchain. And in order to emulate the blockchain, we will first need to deploy the contract on the JavaScript VM. So let's deploy the contract. 
Now we have an instance of the deployed contract. And then we are able to use our contract. Woohoo! This is your first contract. Amazing. That's amazing. So in no time you can already start like creating stuff. Uh, of course, if you I for any reason want to change the implementation, then you can deploy another instance of the pro contract that will return different parameters. Okay? So this is like very, very, very basic stuff, but this is how it works. Of course, we can go much further than that. Um, the goal of Ethereum is basically to create smart contracts. A function that returns the sum is not really super smart. So here what I created is a bit more interesting. Actually, it's the basic of, um, of, of creating your own currency. With Ethereum, you, you can create your own currency, your own tokens. Like if you might have heard about CryptoKitties. No? Yeah, yeah CryptoKitties. They are pretty famous. This is exactly the same. Um, well, not exactly, but this is the same concept. So here I created the concept of voting token. I tell that there is a symbol, there is a total supply. This is very interesting. This mapping, so dictionary, hash map, hash table, uh, call it however you want, where the key is an address and the value is the number of tokens that you have. So it, it reverses the fact that you have a token. Basically, the token knows you. The, ha the, 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 the key is the wallet address. So only the token knows who it belongs to. Then afterwards, we have event. And basically, that's how you can interact with the, um, with the blockchain when you create a JavaScript app. Is you call the API and that you subscribe to events. Then you have the constructor. And basically, the constructor is the, the way that I um, fill in the attributes. And then I have uh, two functions. One is a transfer function that basically tells, yeah, I have that many tokens, and I will transfer it to another wallet. And I have another function that tells, yeah, I will burn, so I will remove for existence this number of tokens. And I have the balance, the get balance of a wallet to understand how many tokens a wallet has. And this is my concept of voting. So basically, first, when I create, when I create the token, I will call the constructor, and I will get all of the tokens, right? Balance off. So the, 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 the message sender will be me. I will be the creator. My wallet will have all of the tokens. Is it clear? Because I don't know. I see some faces where it doesn't seem to be so clear. Who doesn't understand what I'm talking about? Everybody? Great. Okay. Then I don't read Austrian faces. OK. <laughs> um, and afterwards, I need to give the voting tokens to people so that they can vote. And by voting, basically, they will exert their voting rights, and it will burn the token. Here, it's very simple. I can give some wallet X vote, not only one. I mean, it's not fair. Life is not fair. So I can also try to like compile that. Uh, here it is. Oof. I will remove the math because they are pretty stupid. So the math had no constructor, so I didn't need to supply them. But here, 
I need to, um, to, to tell about the constructor arguments. So I need a symbol, I, I need a total supply. Who here is from United Kingdom? No one. So, okay, so I can do my stupid joke, Brexit. <laughs> and let's say I have like 20 tokens of that, and I deploy it. Now I have this voting token stuff, and I ask, what is the total supply? Total supply is 20, symbol, symbol is Brexit, great. I can get the balance of my own account. So this is my own account that is by default. And I say get balance off. And it tells me I have all 20, which what I, I, I told you before. So I didn't lie, that's the first step. And let's say that <coughs> I want to burn 10 of them. Now if I say, what's the total supply, to tell me it's 15, and what's the balance of my account, it should be 15. So this is very, very simple. You can start playing with it. And then, well, I, I won't go into further details, but you have the referendum contract. I, I will give you the links to the source anyway. I link to another file, because obviously it's, I mean, I need to reference other codes, and <coughs> sorry, I create this referendum of objects. Sorry, it's not an object, it's a struct. And then I create this Casvo stuff, and I create enums, blah, 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 blah. I mean, it's, it, it's a bit more complex, but it's the same stuff. And inside, I will, I, I will cast my vote, and I can count the number of votes, and I, I can do a lot of stuff. But if you are a developer, must be not super good <coughs> because yeah this is a sum up of what I told you so you must provide the language version header it's not class it's contract you can return multiple values and they can be named and you have the pure keyword you also have the read-only keyword which basically lets you access the blockchain in a, in a read-only way so the problem is if you want to go beyond that, you need to deploy it on a blockchain. And the blockchain in that case can be your own local private one that you can like create only for your tests or it can be a shared network and there is a testing network called Rinkabye. And in the end, you will need to deploy on the production network. So why is it very important, this pure keyword and this read-only stuff? Basically, if you want to deploy a contract, and that is very different probably from everything you have done before, if you want to deploy, you need to like, update the blockchain database. You need to change its state. You need to add a block. And this, as you might know, requires a lot of computing power because you must resolve a very, very difficult algorithm. So it requires a lot of computing power, and with computing power, it requires a lot of energy. And probably, you don't have enough computing power and, uh, and energy on your laptop. So you might want to have your own mining factory. Right now, this is not cost effective. So you are delegating the mining to someone else. And they have to have computing power and they need to expend energy. Meaning they don't do it for free. You need to pay for that. And every time you deploy something on the blockchain, every time you change the state of the blockchain, you need to pay. I think about it, it really changed the way you look at the world. When you write into a database, you don't care about it. You do it freely because just you need it. Now, if you think that every time you need to update something, you need to pay, you will probably change the way you code. So now I want to deploy on a real network, on the Rickenby network. And for that, I have the Ethereum wallet.
So I'm cheating a bit here. I already have a program called Geth running in the background that synchronizes my computer with the blockchain, the Ethereum blockchain, and the wallet. Oh God, not the demo syndrome, please. Thanks. The wallet will connect to it. If you don't have Geth running in the background, it will launch its own Geth. But I prefer to have only a single one. So here I was already like connected. I have my own account. I already sa I have some Ether. And what I want to do is to deploy my smart contracts. So what I will do is I will, because I'm super lazy, I will deploy the first one, which is very, very simple, but works pretty well. I will deploy this new contract. I write it. Oh, fun part. What happens? Deploy new contract here. There. And here it tells me, hey, you need to pay. I need to pay some fee to the miners, even if it's a test network. So I deploy the contract. Oh. What did I do? Ah, yes. And now I need to supply my passport, so please don't copy-paste. No picture. I heard you. So, here, I sent the request, and I already have someone telling me, yes, I'm mining it. And then there will be other people telling me, yes, we confirm. This is the right data that has been mined. So here I have two confirmations up until 12. At this point, I need to find the right way to click because it happened last time and I don't know where I had to click again. Contract, yes. This is the one. And now my contract is deployed on the blockchain. Wow, you are impressed, right? <laughs> yeah. 23 plus 1 equals 24. Rocket science. Yeah. So now you know how to code Solidity in the browser, just to, to have fun. You can use Ethereum Wallet to deploy your Enrique Buy. What is missing? How do you get your first Ether? How do you get money on the test network? Do you need to spend real money? Well, no, there is something called Enrique Buy Faucet. You need to provide it with either a tweet, with your wallet hash, with a Google Plus post with a, your wallet hash or a Facebook post with your wallet hash. So this is my Google Plus post. And then I can ask for some ether. So basically I'm begging the guy saying, oh, please give me some ether. You can, you can choose like for three days. I won't be able to ask again, but I got a lot of ether all of a sudden. This is not funny. No, 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 no. Yes, yes. Woohoo! And normally here I have 33, and when it's synchronized at some point, I will get, oh, 52. That was pretty quick, right? I'm super rich now. No, no, because it's on the test network. So basically, it's the same technology, the same bits, but because it's not on the same network, it's worth nothing. Funny, right? Again, pure speculation. So then the next step now, 
is to industrialize it. I mean, can you imagine if you are a Java developer, Scala developer, whatever developer, using the graphical user interface? Where are the tests? Who here doesn't test? Yeah. If <laughs> Don't be ashamed. Come on. We were all students once. That's fine. So I want automated testing and I want automated deployment. I want both. I want a lot of things. And Ethereum doesn't provide it by default. So someone came up with a framework, an NPM framework, sorry for that, called Truffle. And with Truffle, basically, you, can have, you have a test framework and you have automated deployment. Also, what you have is your own local private blockchain. So basically, you're able to scaffold the blockchain on the spot, run your tests locally without any synchronization, without spending any ether even on the test network. Sorry, it was a bit quick. I need to do my demo first. So, I will quit that one. And I will show you how you can use Truffle. So the first thing is you can have a Truffle develop. This will scaffold my own local private Ethereum blockchain. So it created some accounts by default. It created the private keys to uh, have to, res um, to reset, I think, the, the wallet key. And now I can test it. So or I already have tests. Uh, or where are they? I'm not sure they are here. I might show them later or perhaps already. Who wants to know to read the tests? Nobody? Good. So I will just run them. Boop. Tests done. So basically here I'm testing the voting token and the voting token plus the contract. This is good and, and nice. I can also get interact with the JavaScript API directly in the console if you don't need to write uh, JavaScript. So here I just say, hey, list all accounts. And it tells me the exact same accounts that were given at the first time, the, the accounts that are registered. You can create your own script to say, hey, give me the balance of my account. Might be a bit small. So it tells me my current account is the first one, and I have not 100 ether. I have a bit more, uh, a bit less ether because I already run the test. And in order to run the test, I had to deploy the contract. And in order to deploy the contract, I had to give ether. Mm. Now I can do the same on Recubby, on the test network, where it cost me some money. So in that case, I, roll, I, I uh, write Truffle console. And I can do the same. I can ask for the balance. Uh-oh. And it doesn't work. I have no clue why it happens. That is bad. So let's try to do better. I will check if, no, it should be good. Here is good. Um, so I will launch the test. Not here, obviously. But I'm afraid it will, I will have the same stuff. Yes. And that's the fun of the network and the live demo, because here I don't know what happens. No suitable peer available. So normally, it means that my get is getting not synchronized, which is <coughs> doesn't seem to be the case. Let's wait a bit. And 
if it doesn't work afterwards, I think that my demo will be failing. Yes, my demo is failing. I really love that. Uh, let's do it now. Yes, great. And now test again. No, okay. This is failing. This is really bad. Um, I won't try to bullshit you. This was not planned. I don't know. It's about the network. Perhaps if I remove the VPN, I might get better results. No. I will restart Geth, and if it doesn't restart correctly, then I will call it a day. The wallet is not running. Hmm. Nobody is hacking the is hacking the Wi-Fi. So that's why I launched it a bit before because yeah, the first synchronization takes a bit of time. It must establish network connections, understand the states I am the the local network is in, the local state is in, and then start synchronizing. Let's try again, perhaps, yes. Uh-huh, I have like three hours of delay. Something was wrong here. Yes, much better. See? So now I have this ETH here that is, seems to be not in sync with the 50 something that I uh, used for previously because it's getting synced. Um, and I can test, finally. And now it tells me this was planned. Because now I'm trying to use the real, I mean the real test network, and so this is secured. And in order for you to be secured, I need to authentify with a password. So I'm using the Web3 API to unlock my account, and now finally I can test. And this is going to take ages if it works, and in the end, Tests will fail because I don't give enough money to the deploy contract. This is just to tell you how it works. And this is the end of the presentation. So um, if you are interested, you can follow my blog, though it's mainly not about Ethereum. Uh, you can follow me on Twitter. And this is the sources. So you didn't want to check the test. But here at this uh, GitHub the repository, you have uh, the test, you have the deployment, you have the voting contract, you have the uh, referendum contract, so you can check everything. And I guess I was super good. Now there is time for some question. <laughs> I, I'm not used to the German way, sorry. <laughs> yes, we have five minutes for questions, so if anybody's got one, please raise your hand. I'm super afraid. When there is no question, it was not that great, right? Anyone? Yes. Uh, Thanks. What kind of code is usually deployed on the, on the blockchain? I mean, it's cool that I can deploy some code, but what is... The byte code, you mean? No, no, no. What, what kind of code? Ah, the use case, you mean? Yeah, yeah. Ah, the use case. <laughs> Yes. Um, well, again, my presentation was about the blockchain. That's, I mean, you must have in your startup presentation, otherwise it's worth nothing. Actually, when you think about it, it, it there are not that many use cases. Um, fintechs, they want to deploy blockchains because they want to remove the bank proxies. Fine. Banks, they want to deploy blockchain because they want to like drown the startups before they get successful. Yes, that's cutthroat business, but actually you want to deploy blockchain when you want to remove useless proxies, useless intermediaries in a process. And yeah, in, current, in the current world, there are a lot of useless proxies that take a cut and then at, at the end of the, of, the, of the sales chain, there you, the customer that basically paid for everyone along the way. So I'm not a business guy, 
but I, 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 I had a very interesting use case presented to, to me six months ago. There is a gaming company, and they are providing a card game, collectible card game, but electronic collectible card game. So, Magic the Gathering, anyone? Yeah, good. And with Magic the Gathering, with the, the physical card, you can exchange them, and you have the same with, I don't know, Pokemon. I mean, they allow you to trade the cards between players. The thing is, in order to do that, they need to provide the marketplace to do it. So they need to provide, I mean, the software to do it. And it's, I mean, it's, it's a lot of effort. In general, they get nothing out of it. And what? Well. And this guy from the gaming company, basically, they bound the cards, the, the, the electronic cards, to a blockchain. So that's basically, it was like a token, like I showed before. And so they removed themselves from the transaction. So basically, players can exchange the cards between themselves, and they have no send the matter. They can exchange the <coughs> cards for money. They can exchange the card for goods, for services, for whatever they want. And they can do it freely without any proxies. I found that very interesting. Oh, I wanted to show you something um, I forgot. I told you that everything is transparent on the blockchain. So here, for example, I can have my, um, my wallet. Yeah, so it doesn't work, obviously. Look. I can have my wallet, and I can check what I did with my wallet previously. So I just search for the hash, and you can see exactly what I did. So here, you can see the ether that I asked for during this presentation. Here you can see the ether that I asked for during my previous presentation. And here you can probably see the contract creation and all the stuff that I did during this presentation for the test. So the only thing here that you don't see is that it belongs to me, to my ID, to Nicola. But the rest is available publicly. Because again, everybody has a copy of the blockchain on his own computer. So this is just the way to access it in a very easy way. I forgot to... Uh, oh, the killer question. I don't know. You can. Shit happens. Other questions? I'm afraid that's all the time we have. <laughs> Sorry about you that. You saved my life because uh, people are shy. I think that Austrians are shy. <laughs> well, Nicola, thank you so much for your thank talk. You. Let's give him another round of applause, please. I will stay here until, uh, well, the end, so at the, uh, before the after party, during the after party, or during the after after party, you can come to me and let's talk. Thank you very much. Great. So, thank you very much. Thanks. Next up is Lucas. We're going to get him set up, so it'll just uh, be a few minutes.